but on smaller parcels, we have taken on that risk when we know we've got a good cost basis. We will do that. We'll buy it within 30, 60 days. Uh, you know, we'll obviously make sure we'll analyze the holding costs and all the, and all the risk that goes into it. But we kind of make an educated decision about that risk process and kind of go from there. Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. If you are enjoying the show and getting some great value for your investing needs, we want to hear from you. Leave us some honest feedback with a rating and review. And if you haven't done so, make sure you hit that follow or subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Listen, we got a great show today. We're going to be talking to Lior Rosansky. They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you want to grow as a multifamily investor, you have to spend more time with other multifamily investors. And an easy way to do that is to join our apartment investing mastermind group today. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the mastermind button. Now, as a part of this group, you'll get access to expert trainings, group coaching calls, industry news and updates, as well as all of our webinars and workshops, including our three-hour workshop on raising capital. Again, if you want to be around other multifamily investors that can help you scale your portfolio today and grow your network, make sure you're a part of the Apartment Investing Mastermind. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the Mastermind button today. Now, for Leo Rosansky, the road to real estate has been a series of unexpected swerves along the path to other things. Now, it's really born, but Boston, let me say it again. Israeli born but Boston raised, Rosansky says he found and fell for real estate during what was supposed to be a gap year in management consulting before heading to medical school. Uh, we're going to learn more about his journey into commercial real estate. Let's welcome on to the show, Lior Rosansky. Appreciate you having me here, John. I'm uh, Like I said, I'm excited to rock and roll, see where this uh, conversation takes us. I love it, man. Listen, I started to get into a little bit about your story, but it's much better to hear from you directly. Uh, tell us about your background and kind of how you got into multifamily. Awesome. Yeah, uh, so you kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's really been a journey of unexpected swerves, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, yeah, so I started, I uh, went to school for pre-med, uh, was applying to med schools, um, med schools during my gap year, and, uh, you know, kind of just thought, you know what, let me toss an offer on a property. Uh, I had some buddies in construction that I always kept talking about it. And I was like, you know what, I'm smarter than them. I'll just do it. Um, so I ended up tossing an offer, got accepted, pulled my apps out of med school. And honestly, the rest is kind of history, right? I, um, you know, the first couple of years I was doing, uh, you know, I was doing some brokerage work. I was starting to buy up some value add um, existing multifamilies, as well as do some, uh, you know, gut projects where I was doing some condo projects early on. Then, you know, through 2018, I'd say through 2022, really focused on buying uh, and growing out a portfolio here in Boston. Um, and then over the last 18, 24 months, kind of had another little bit of a pivot where, uh, you know, really started to integrate a lot more development into the business. Um, so today, you know, in addition to buying, continuing to buy value add projects, um, you know, we're doing some new construction and development, everything from luxury single families to, um, you know, adaptive reuse and ground up multifamily. I love it, man. I love it. So you're in med school or getting ready to go to med school during this gap year, took a whim from your construction buddies to put an offer on a property, got it, completely pivoted and said, all right, let me, let me just focus on real estate for right now. And that's where you've been ever since, right? Changing strategies a little bit here, doing some ground up development and other things, but never really looked back at med school. Any regrets on that? Uh, none. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally. Yeah, I still get asked by my mom every day, every time I see her when I'm uh, when I'm going to go and be a doctor. But no, I mean, in all seriousness, no, really, really no regrets. I mean, to me, it's been, you know, it's obviously a bumpy ride, you know, I mean, it, you know, investment is, uh, it, it's it's a full consuming journey. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I've got plenty of friends that are doctors, and uh, I've got literally zero envy. So I'm, uh, I'm good. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your strategy and kind of what you do, right? You mentioned that you focus on the Boston area. What kind of projects did you do, especially starting out? Yeah, so early on, I mean, I'm from the Boston area. I went to school here, so I really had a pretty good understanding, at least, of the Boston market. So that's why we started here. Probably one of the unique things about Boston that you know listeners may or may not know, it is a little bit of a different game here um, than maybe more traditional commercial real estate you might see in other parts of the country. We don't have huge apartment complexes, right? Like if you go and 
you know, Texas, Florida, Carolinas, you'll see these 100, 200 unit uh, complexes everywhere. We don't really have that here. Um, Boston, you know, it's a very tight urban city. Um, big apartment complexes here are like 40, 50 units are considered like very, very large. Um, you know, so what we did early on was we kind of focused on smaller to maybe smallish midsize multis, um, all in the urban center, uh, right around basically the Boston area. Um, you know, it, it made the area made sense to me. I'm still, I, I was very high on it and I'm still very high on it. And, you know, what we started doing is kind of one step at a time, right? Started with some value add projects, um, where we're doing kitchens, baths, um, you know, and, and, and I should say too, value add in Boston is also a little bit different, right? I know in other parts of the country, you can get away with like five, $10,000 per unit renovations. When I say light value out here, like light stuff is like 25, 30,000. Uh, Midsize is probably like 50, 70,000 and heavier is like 100, 150,000 per unit. So, you know, def definitely a little bit of a different scope, but overall the strategy, you know, kind of remained the same. Yeah, I love that. And I appreciate you clarifying it because one of the things that always intrigues me is, you know, when you, you listen to podcasts like this and you hear guests talk about, you know, their strategy. And I used to live in Chicago and Chicago has a lot of similarities to what you're describing here in Boston. And I would always be floored because these guys would talk. I'm like, you can't find any of that stuff in Chicago. Right. And, and Boston obviously has that old heritage as far as the city as well. So, you know, when you talk about these things, it's just a little bit of a different market. One thing you talked about there was that a light value add for you is, is 25 K a door, right. Which would be a heavy value add or, you know, almost a distressed or, you know, uh, really a property that needs a ton of work in, in our world for most multifamily deals in the Midwest and the Southeast region there. When you talk about, you know, again, 25K a unit, not to go crazy. We talked about not going into math before this, right? But when you talk about, you know, that kind of investment to renovate a, a unit, is that a gut rehab? Like what exactly are we talking about for that to be light? Well, especially if you're saying, hey, a more intense rehab is more 40 or 50,000 a unit. Yeah, um, it's yeah, that's a good question. Uh, twenty five around here is you know I, what I would consider definition of very light value at right. I mean we're probably replacing kitchen cabinets, you know, new countertops, appliance package, flooring, um, basic basic bathroom upgrade, right? Probably keeping the tub and just maybe doing the uh, new new tiling, uh, replacing vanities. Um, very basic stuff like paint, you know, sand floors. Yeah, that stuff here all are day. You, are you painting with gold? <laughs> no, no. I, I, you know, that's just that's the that's the price of doing business here. I mean, you know, to me, twenty five thirty is like almost a very very base of like yeah. what I can get away with to put up a clean, you know, yeah. newish looking apartment. Okay. If I'm going to start really going down the trenches, I'm going to start, you know, I mean, Boston, ha the other thing you have to remember is Boston, 100 year old buildings here too, right? So once we're starting going into heavier, like, quote unquote, medium value add, um, you know, now we're opening up walls, we're updating electrical, we're updating plumbing, we're updating heating systems, easily push into the 50, 60, 70 per unit um, kind of range. And then if we're going to just gut, uh, uh, you know, basically just gut it and start from scratch demo to the studs um you know probably in the vicinity of a buck 20 buck 50 per unit all day yeah i mean listen the, these prices are obviously going to change based on the market this is a great reminder that real estate is local so you know when you're hearing some of these numbers they may surprise you in a good way they may shock you in a bad way but either way it's really important to understand what does it cost to do business in the neighborhoods that you're looking to invest in i appreciate you sharing that because Obviously, it's a little bit different. You got your material costs, you have your labor costs, uh, you have, again, permitting, you have other things like that, which can certainly run those prices up. And a big thing there is that once you start opening up walls, well, now you're talking about electrical, plumbing, HVAC systems, and for 100-year-old buildings, you are almost always going to have to replace something in there because the property is just that old. So really great intel. Uh, when you're starting out, you know, I imagine you didn't have a ton of capital to get going, but maybe you did. For someone who is in a high ticket market, Boston, New York, Chicago, some of these cities where it is somewhat pricey to implement that business plan or that strategy, what advice would you give them to get started to make sure they don't bite off more than they could chew, particularly if these renovation budgets can be this hefty? 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the way, it, it, you know, and I'll kind of say from a financial perspective as well as an operational perspective, right? Uh, from a fine, you know, just to and just to kind of give context, yeah. When I bought my first building, I was 23 years old, no family money, kind of saved up what I could from my first, you know, management consulting job when I was doing. Um, but a, a lot of my deals have been with obviously with JV equity, right? I mean, uh, it, it's not like I'm doing any in, um, any in-house sort of capital. But what I would say in terms of the financial side is exactly that, right? I mean, if you're not coming from capital, if you don't have that in-house family, whatever it may be, I mean, you're gonna have to get creative, right? Bottom line. Um, so whether you're going to be partnering um, with other established operators, whether you're going to be trying to raise money for your first deal, you know, there's different avenues. Um, I'd say just figure out what works best for you, right? Like for me at that time, when I was really starting to buy setting up building number two, number three, at that point, I've done a fair amount of networking. It was probably, you know, a year, year and a half of like a lot of on the ground work, talking to a lot of people, um, you know, and I was able to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars based upon all that work. Um, but probably the more complex side, honestly, is the operational side, right? Because especially if you don't come from construction, like, you know, I, again, I was a science kid, right? Like, I mean, I knew nothing about construction. No one in my family has any construction experience or background. My dad always told me I have two left hands, so I can't do anything myself, right? So, um, you know, if you don't know anything about construction, right? And I and actually, I'll give this quick quote as a or just quick story. When I pulled my first, uh, when I did my first building, my partner was like, "Hey, we got to go pull a permit." And I was like, "Dude, what what the hell's a permit? I have no idea what that is." Uh, so you know, I'm literally starting from base from base zero. Um, you know, so on oper operational side, if that's you, right? Um, figure out who you can work with, right? That can provide that experience, right? So my first couple of buildings, I partnered up with an experienced uh, local developer. He had been doing projects for two to three years at that point. Um, obviously already understood the process, had subs that he could call on right away, um, understood what needed to go into permitting, what needed to go to, you know, operationally. Um, so I, you know, basically mooched off of him for the first couple of projects, really just trying to understand what the heck's going on um, and really kind of carving my teeth in that way. Listen, very valuable advice, right? When you're starting out, particularly when you don't have a lot of capital, but even when you're starting out in general, you got to lean on other people, you know, find those partners, find the people who have that experience and the knowledge, both on the operation side, the construction side, but you also need the capital partners, right? On the financing side as well. So this is one of the things that we stress and you hear over and over and over, but this is a team sport. Don't feel like you have to do this by yourself, right? Find people who have that experience, the knowledge, the expertise, and lean on that until you're able and comfortable enough to do it by yourself. At a certain point, you can go out there and do it, but don't make the mistake starting out when someone else has years and years of experience. Lean on that experience as opposed to trying to figure out what a permit is and making a huge mistake out of the gate. Uh, talk to us about what you're doing today. I know you started talking a little about development, but where's your business today and where's it headed? Yeah. So to, uh, today, I mean, I'd say we kind of, I kind of have two focuses. Um, you know, I still look at, you know, the same sort of value add projects. Um, you know, we've definitely upped our deal size. Um, you know, in the, when starting out in the first couple of years, we were probably sub 2 million bucks, which again, in Boston is still a decent chunk. Um, now we're kind of look, you know, now we're kind of operating more in the three to $10 million space here, um, which is getting us bigger portfolios or slightly, you know, kind of more true mid-sized to maybe smaller, larger buildings. Um, you know, that's definitely one focus. And then, yeah, the second focus um, over the last 24 months or so um, has been development, right? And it's not, it wasn't like a super strategic thing that I planned out from like the get go. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to start to do construction, um, new, new dev projects. Um, you know, it was really me just thinking and saying, hey, like, we've got the expertise, right? Like, we know how to do work in Boston. It's not an easy place to work in, right? So like, when I was thinking about how do I really continue to grow and scale, like, you know, some of the thoughts I was like, do I go expand into new markets, right? I've been pitched on different markets in the mass area. I've been, you know, I was doing some diligence um, in areas in like the South and Southeast, right? To potentially go bigger. But what I really thought through was like, hey, like I've got this pretty unique set of skills about being able to operate in this particular market. So why don't we just turbocharge this, right? Like, why don't we go 
And instead of just doing, you know, whether it's a medium value add or gut rehabs, let's go and do adaptive reuse. Let's go do, let's go build ground up, right? And um, so today we're doing anything from, you know, right now gut projects where we're doing a three unit ground up condo project. We've got a six unit um, adaptive reuse uh, that we bought a pre, you know, we bought a church and rezoned it to apartments. Um, we actually just closed on a 15 unit development that we're going to get going shortly in the city as well. Um, so really just kind of adding to the scope of uh, within our, uh, within our expertise. I love it. You know, taking a look at what you already do well, you know, where have you built up some skills and some resources and instead of spreading that to a new market and trying to replicate it in a new market where you still got to build up the team and the expertise, taking that and just saying, okay, maybe we can apply that a little bit differently in our home market. So for you, it's focusing a little bit more ground up development, some adaptive reuse and other opportunities there. For adaptive reuse, that term may be new for some of our listeners. Explain exactly what that is and the way you view it. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just a fancy way of saying like we're taking you know, non-current residential use buildings, right? And then rezoning them into, um, you know, in, into residential use. So the example I can give, so the project we have going on, right? We bought um, like a six or seven, uh, 6,000 square foot previous uh, church, right? I mean, it was a church in the city, um, had one big kind of open layout, as you can probably imagine a church would be. Uh, we bought that property, we rezoned it, right? We went through the permitting process um, and rezoned it, got approvals to do six residential apartments. And now we're basically gutting that building from scratch and building it, you know, building it out to fit six apartments. And that opportunity exists pretty well here, right? Because, you know, Boston, ha as you probably can imagine, has a lot of older buildings. Um, there's a lot of different like old brick buildings that were used for industrial purposes, right? Uh, way back in the day. And a lot of the city has been convert, you know, there's been very big projects that have taken that those buildings and converted them into residential use. So it's, it's not a new idea. Um, but you know, it's, it's another great way to get creative, get stuff at a good basis, uh, at a good cost basis and create residential product. I think it's a great insight, because for those who are having a hard time finding deals that work or pencil today, you may have to be creative. And what you're talking about is finding properties where the current use is maybe misaligned with the market opportunity, old churches, offices, buildings, hotels, motels, things like this, where maybe there isn't as much demand for those buildings in that capacity, but we know there's a huge shortage in housing, right? So multifamily, there's still strong demand. Maybe there's an opportunity to go in there, buy the property at a good cost basis or entry point, make those renovations or improvements. And now you've got a really good property that you've been able to kind of create, right? And reposition. What does that process look like? I know you talked about the permitting and the zoning and all of that. Like, do you start with let's lock up the property and then figure this out? Do you start by having conversations with the zoning commission? Walk us through kind of the initial stages of, hey, there's this building. What do I do to kind of get this thing under contract and get it permitted and, and zoned for what our vision is? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so I, I will say I will preface the answer to say that Boston is kind of notoriously known to be one of the worst cities for permitting, uh, you know, where uh, the joke always is like you can permit a skyscraper in New York for within six months. Here are average permitting timelines like 12 to 18 months, honestly. Um, so take, you know, take whatever I say with a grain of salt for your market. Uh, but, you know, the way we generally approach, whether it's we're buying a commercial structure that we're looking to rezone, or even if it's a vacant piece of land, right, is we first want to figure out what do we think we can do with it, right? Like, what's what's the general thesis? Now, ge generally, I don't like to buy things what I call clean, right? So I wouldn't want to go and buy this building, basically close within 30 days, and then start the entitlement process where, you know, I basically have to hire my architect, my surveyor, draw up plans. I have to submit them to the city. I have to then go through multiple neighborhood meetings, right? I meet with my butters. I meet with local community groups. I get all of their feedback. I kind of make my adjustments based on the feedback. And ultimately, then I go in front of the zoning board. You can imagine, as I said, this is a long period in Boston, right? I mean, that's easily a 12-month process, usually longer. So if I'm buying a building or a piece of land clean, 
not only am I taking, um, so, you know, what, not only am I taking hold, holding cost on, right? So like if I buy a million dollar building, whatever my debt is during that time, I'm just bleeding that money out, right? But I'm also taking huge risk, right? Because, you know, it's never a guarantee of what the city will ultimately approve. I mean, I've seen plenty of great proposals that even neighborhoods have approved of. And then, you know, the investors or developers go in front of the, of the zoning board and they get shut down, right? And now what do you do, right? So it's, it is a little bit of a riskier business to go buy buildings clean. Um, unfortunately, we've had to do that. So this church project that I mentioned, we had to do that because the competitive landscape is just so competitive here where, you know, sometimes sellers are just not willing to work with you and do what we call like a zoning or permitting contingency, right? Where they hold off, we don't close for a year um, and we only close once we get permits. I mean, that's the ideal world. And it certainly does happen. And on bigger projects that I'm looking at today, I certainly am not willing to gamble, you know, four or five, six million bucks plus. Um, but on smaller parcels, we have taken on that risk when we know we've got a good cost basis. We will do that. We'll buy it within 30, 60 days. Uh, you know, we'll obviously make sure we'll analyze the holding costs and all the and all the risk that goes into it. But we kind of make an educated decision about that, you know, about that risk process and kind of go from there. You mentioned buying clean. Um, and I mean, I think most people can kind of figure out what you were talking about there a little bit. But if you don't prefer to buy clean, what is the route you prefer to buy? Right. So you can either buy uh, by clean. I basically mean with no no permitting contingency. Right. That's it's you're either buying with a permitting contingency or you're closing, let's say, 60 to 90 days, whatever it might be. And with the permitting contingency structure, the way it would work is, right, we sign a, a purchase and sales contract with a seller. And then we typically have, you know, and I'd say 12 months on average to go through the entitlement process we as the developer will still spend all the money on the entitlement. So we'll hire the zoning attorney, we'll hire the architects, um, engineers, surveyors, whatever needs to happen. But we're not actually closing on the land until we have approvals from the city, right? And basically why this is insanely helpful is A, again, we're not, we're, we don't, we're not, we don't have any debt on the property. So we're not bleeding every month. And B, if for whatever reason, the zoning board does shut us down, Right, we can technically back out of the uh, back out of that offer, right? I mean, we, you know, obviously we're going to blow that twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars that it costs to entitle, but that's just, you know, that's a, that's just the cost of doing business as a developer. At least we're not buying a million dollar parcel that, you know, where we thought we could put on six units, but now we can only put on like a, a single family or two family or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think that's really important, right? So you still have cost involved, right? You're, you you got to go through the entitlement process. You're still taking on that responsibility, but you at least have some flexibility if the zoning commission shuts down your plans and what they provide back is is not doable. Uh, you can go back and have your feasibility report or you know work with that seller or that owner and decide, hey, maybe there's uh, you know some 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 retrading that can take place to make this deal work if that owner's still there. But it gives you some flexibility, so you're not holding that for a year while you're waiting on getting this feedback and approval. So certainly a great strategy if you're going to be in the development space. You know, I loved hearing you talk about just the way you've grown in the space, right? Talking about, you know, just really getting out there, trying some stuff, buying some value add deals, getting into, you know, the the adaptive reuse, getting into ground up development. What excites you the most? I mean, what, what gets you going? What are you most excited about as you kind of look forward? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, it's funny as uh, I, I was just having this conversation with another investor the other day, you know, when I first started out, and I think like a lot of us do, right, like we get, ex we, we kind of learn about multifamily, usually through the means of like, financial independence, right, financial freedom. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, and that's a great goal to have. Now, you know, for me, uh, you know, we after years of work, we ended up doing pretty well, right. And the kind of the next conversation was, okay, so like now what, right? Um, wh what is it really that I'm going after, right? And, you know, me being just having a longer run span, I mean, you know, still kind of younger on the younger side right now. Um, I can quote unquote retire, I guess, you know, which is like what a lot of people talk about on social media these days. But that, that you know, that's not really the path that I'm like excited about, right? Like, it's not like, oh, I hit this, 
X amount of dollars per month income or X amount of dollar net worth, right? That's, that's, those are great metrics to judge progress on, but that wasn't necessarily something I wanted to judge my end goal, right? So, you know, the, one of the reasons why we started, you know, I really started to go ahead first into the development space is I was thinking like, how can I really leave a mark, right? Like, how do we even grow, you know, make, do something that really changes um, and puts our stamp on the city? And, you know, as I, the more I thought about it, I was like, look, if I can throw, start throwing up buildings, um, you know, anything 30, 40, 50, 60 plus units, um, and really changing a lot of these neighborhoods here around around the city. I mean, that's just, you know, when, when people say legacy, that's true legacy, right? Like, obviously, there's the financial aspect of it. But it's like, you know, your work is going to be represented for a very, very long time by everyone that drives it, right? So that that's kind of like the higher level ideas I started to have. And honestly, that was one of the main reasons why I kind of started to get really excited about the prospect of doing larger developments. Um, not just obviously the, the financial rewards can be really good and that's, that's great. Um, but it's really just about what kind of impact and, uh, what kind of mark for yourself you can put on, um, you know, in the city that you operate in. Yeah. I love you talk about legacy. It goes beyond generational wealth, right. But also the lasting legacy you have as an investor, as a developer, you know, that that's really important as well. And I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, for folks who want to learn more, they can check you out on your website, floorcap.com. That's F-L-O-R-A cap.com. We'll make sure we link to that in our show notes. Lior, you are someone who has really kind of expanded and grown your portfolio, now looking at kind of the legacy opportunities there. When you're looking to partner with people, what's a common question you get that maybe would surprise people, you know, about maybe investing with you or kind of your business strategy? What's a common question you come across? Uh, you mean from, from a partnership, like on the from, operational side? From from people looking to invest primarily who are, maybe aren't as familiar with the operational side of it. Got it. Yeah, you know, it, from, from the investment side was, you know, especially when I have a lot of uh, LP conversations, right, with people that are looking to invest, whether it's, value add or whether it's um you know or it's ground up development it, i think you know there's a lot of advice out there but i've kind of boiled it down to what what's important to you right like very very simply trying to really get to the crux of what's important to you right because and, I, and, I'll, and I'll kind of contextualize that um you know i was doing a pretty big raise for that um i, I mentioned i just closed on a large development where we we're going to do 15 units you know, I kind of actually had to pivot my strategy on the equity side, because initially what I thought people would be really excited about is getting equity ownership in that building and then setting it on long term over the long term um, and kind of get, reaping the rewards. And you think, hey, like that sounds like a great strategy, right? Like I'm sure some people will be excited about. And I was like gun ho ready to roll. And when I started to really talk to people and really understand what they were looking for, particularly in this environment that we're in, right, that's, you know, kind of volatile, a lot of people were really nervous about that, right? A lot of people are really nervous about locking up equity for multiple years. Um, you know, they obviously understood the potential benefits, like we're in the city, we're in a really stable market. Uh, but the idea of locking in equity for such a long time started, you know, really, I kind of felt started to deter people. So I kind of had to switch up my offering, right? Instead of a LP ownership kind of traditional equity structure, I kind of had to go and change it up to kind of more of a prep equity structure, right? Where I was mm -hmm. giving, uh, where I was giving them, uh, you know, more immediate cash flow opportunity, but basically no upside, right? And as soon as I switched that up, you know, green lights all across the board, right? People were raising their hand, like, "Yeah, this is what I want right now," and I get it, right? I mean, what you know. It, it, we're, like I said, we're kind of in a volatile period right now. Sure, like like long term own, ownership is great, but you know sometimes you just kind of want yield uh, coming in right away. You want the certainty of some sort of return. Um, you know when things may not be so certain ev everywhere else. So you know you kind of have to really have these conversations. And just because you choose one strategy doesn't mean that's what's going to resonate with you know with the people that are going to invest with you ultimately. Yeah, that's really insightful to understand that, you know, there may be a return or capital stack that you think makes sense and maybe is the best for the investor on paper. 
but it doesn't bring out the psychological aspect of what they're looking for. And yes, I understand sometimes there might be better or higher returns, having more equity long-term in a deal. But for some people, they, they want to have more cash flow sooner, uh, which feels a little bit more certain than, you know, maybe that, that big, that big tick on the upside on the back end. So definitely make sure you understand what investors are looking for having those conversations and then adjusting your offer accordingly. Great stuff there, Lior. Uh, again, if folks want to learn more, they can check out your website, floorcap.com. Right now we're going to transition to our round of insights. Lior, give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. My my very one of my very first development projects I did, uh, where we did a condo project in the city. This was like a year of me breaking into the business. I ended up losing a little money on that, right? I partner, I part one. I, I, I had a bad, not, not so great partner, I guess I should say. Um, but I learned a lot of hard lessons, right? I learned what it means to be in a partnership. I learned what it means to run projects with other folks. So, you know, it was, it, to me, it was definitely a kick in the teeth, especially that was like my life savings at that point as it's like a 23, 24 year old or whatever. Um, but you know, that was, that was kind of my MBA, one of my MBAs, like really understanding how things work in the real world. <laughs> Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. I like, um, that's a good question. I like, uh, I've been using a task management platform recently. Um, so I, I really like Asana, um, helps me kind of track all the little things that need to be broken down by project. Um, you know, I've got a couple of people that I've hired on my team. I integrated them right into it. Um, helps us make sure that we're tracking all the, you know, all the kind of miscellaneous activities and little things that need to be followed up on. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. Uh, I'll say, actually, I just finished up uh, Don Peebles' book. Um, I think it's called The Peebles Principles. Uh, for you guys that are not familiar with him, he's a quite a large, a huge developer now. Uh, started off in D.C. Now he's putting up skyscrapers across the country. Uh, but he's got some really, really cool insights, the way he structured deals. Um, I think it was a really, really fascinating read. So I really recommend that. Give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. Uh, first thing I do in the morning is write down, write down my critical tasks for the day, everything that needs to get done, outline a quick schedule, write down my goals for the year, and off I roll. Give me your number one insight for development. Partnerships. And de development, just like multifamily, maybe even more so, is a team sport. There is so many things that go wrong on a daily basis, and there's so many things that can go and will go wrong, and that you don't, that you may not have the answers about. Working with people, A, that you like, B, that have experience, um, absolutely huge, right? I mean, there's, there's no way I could run a development site myself. Um, I would, you know, there's no way I would be able to do multiple sites, and there's just, you know, I, I, I'm sure I'd mess it up somehow, right? It, it, having the right people is absolutely critical. Leo, you're in Boston, as we've talked about. Give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat. Boston, uh, that's a tough question. Uh, I've been on a big Mediterranean grind lately. So we have this great Greek place right in the city and seaport. Um, uh, it's called Committee, one of my favorites. We go there a lot. I'm like a couple minutes, I live a couple minutes away. Uh, but if you guys are ever in Boston, hit me up. I'll give you the full list. <laughs> there you go. We love it. We love it. Leo, you gave some great information, man. I loved hearing about your story, getting, you know, coming off your gap year and getting into real estate uh, a little bit on a whim, but deciding, hey, let's try this out, having good success out of the gate and then really evolving your strategy. I, I love and one of my big takeaways is how you're always looking for the next opportunity and expanding, right? So as you look to grow, it's not just doing more of what you were doing, but to say, hey, where do I have some competitive advantages here? I've got the teams, I've got the systems. Can we do more ground of development as opposed to maybe changing markets? So recognizing that you have invested in building out your teams and your systems in Boston and then figuring out other ways to deploy those systems in the teams. That's a great way to think about our business, right? If you want to grow and you want to scale, figure out what you're doing well, figure out what you can adjust, where the opportunities are. And that may open up some more doors that maybe you're not privy to or thinking about. So really, really great insights. Again, for folks that want to learn more, check out floorcap.com.
Leor, Lior, I want to thank you again for being a great guest and coming on Multifamily Insights. We look forward to staying in touch with you, and I hope you have a great day.